maybe I'll talk a little bit about when I first saw Hans. Uh, Matt and I went down to, it's called the Conservation and Action Tour in Livingston County, Illinois. Illinois is another one of those states that are really trying to push the conservation practices. Um, they're kind of behind, I think, a little bit, and I don't know how far Michigan is with conservation practices, but you know, we're working on that. We're spreading the news of the profitability and you know the soil health and water health, and so they're doing that down there. But Hans was very excited about what he was teaching, and I and I couldn't understand what he was saying, and so that was exciting to me because you know I this is what I do too. I have to teach people about this, so if he can speak to me in words that I understand and I can speak into words that you guys understand, I think we can start getting our message across. So just to give you guys a little bit of background about Hans, he's the coordinator for the Indiana Conservation Cropping System. He's also a certified crop advisor. He received his PhD in agricultural engineering from the University of Idaho, and his undergrad degree came from Agricultural University in the Netherlands, where he's from. Hans has been working on erosion protection and conservation tillage systems for over 20 years. So he's got this down. Uh, both all over the US and as well as in the Netherlands, Spain, and Israel. Um, he's worked for universities, extensions, private sectors, and now for the state of Indiana. He also has numerous publications and articles. Well, but more so, he works with growers. So he goes out to growers' farms, he troubleshoots with them, he promotes these practices, he works with growers who have success with these practices. So he's able to you know, really share both sides of this with us. Um, I guess without further ado, I should just let Hans take over. Sure. Thank you, Elaine. That's scary when you get applause before you start. <laughs> Oh, that was so funny. Thank you. I like that. Good, good, good. I deserve that. Okay. <laughs> All right, good morning. So I'm one of the few Dutch guys whose name doesn't start with Van. Uh, there's a couple of us. Uh, been in the States since 84. I was one of those pesky exchange students that came here, fell in love with the place, and never left. So I go back to visit now and then, but uh, citizen, all that kind of stuff. And from the resume you could hear, I can't hold a job. About five years, I'm <laughs> going to the next job. So. Uh, today, Colleen asked me to talk to you about why improved soil health will benefit your farm. Uh, that's the title I was given. Uh, so I'll try to get to that with you. We, we have some demonstrations for you. and. Um, and, and a couple slides. Of course, Colleen gave me a little over an hour. I have 572 slides, so it's going to be more like a video, okay? It'll go pretty fast. Uh, this is the topic that I dearly love, the, the soil. Uh, soil health is still a real fuzzy term. We'll get into it a little bit. And then how that actually pays off and does things for people. But um, this is a eight-hour workshop. This is a two-week workshop, whatever you want to do. We're going to talk about it in an hour, so we're kind of going to skip on the surface and then just talk about some things. If you want to learn more about it, lots of ways we can do that. Sound okay in the back? Good. When the settlers came to, uh, let's talk about our soils. When the settlers came to the Midwest, this is mainly what they found, minus the park benches, uh, forested land all over the place out there, and they decided to make farmland out of that. Some people found this, the prairies, the tall grass or the short grass prairies, and uh, again, they brought their wonderful technology from Europe, the moldboard plow, to make this into farmland. Now, their moldboard plows didn't look like this. They had one or two shears, because you cannot hook enough mules up to one of these to actually get the land going. They took the trees off, uh, they plowed up the land, started planting crops, and life was good. Fabulous yields for their times. These were all virgin soils, basically, had to be farmed, and things went quite well for a while. However, it didn't take but a couple decades, and things started going south. Uh, we had big windstorms, we had wind erosion happening everywhere. Of course, everybody's aware of the, the, the Great Plains. This is Garden City in 1932. Garden City, Kansas, that is. I work in Kansas for eight years. Uh, and then even around here, this is Brown County, Indiana. They farmed it for about 20 years, went really well. And then the birds were eroded to the point that they have had to go back to forest. The population plummeted by more than half, and now actually it took till 1999 to get the population back to the pre-1920 levels. Because everything had to go back to forest, all the farmers had to leave. So something happened to our soils 
that caused us not to be able to farm anymore. Now, if we look at our soils, um, by the way, Colleen, there. Are the lights okay, or do we need to turn off some lights? I can see it. You guys can see it all right? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm standing here under one of those bright guys. If we look at our soils, everybody's seen the soil map, and if you look at a soil map within those boundaries, you would expect the soil to be somewhat similar, especially if you take two soil samples very close together. And what I've been noticing over the last couple of years, that doesn't always happen. A couple of years ago, we were in uh, central Indiana, we were taking some soil samples on the farmer's farm. Uh, this is Farmer Kane on the right hand side, he asked us to take some samples. And uh, his field, there's a little surface road here, this is his field, that's a neighbor's field. And we noticed there was something going on. What happened here is that, uh, so these farms were farmed the same for, for decades and decades. And then about 20, 25 years ago, these guys, these guys decided to go no-till. And you look at those two farm fields and you see a difference. And I made a big mistake when I soil sampled. I didn't clean my gear, and this is what I ended up with. My little shovel has two kinds of soil in there. These are topsoils. So according to the map, those are supposed to be absolutely the same. The samples were taken from me to you about there, so very close together across that little surface road. Yet the neighbor has this sticky yellow clay, and the canes have this nice crumbly black stuff. This is exactly the same soil type you would assume about 25 years ago before they started no-till. So in 25 years, they've actually gone to that. But how come his neighbor is having this other stuff? And that's what the whole point is here. We're not farming grandpa's farm anymore. When we took out the forest, we had a certain soil that had 4 to 5 percent organic matter. And we have been plowing those soils, plowing those soils, because that that's the technology we had at the time. And we've degraded those soils dramatically by taking the organic matter down. And that is the big thing we've done, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Here's an actual example where they measured that. In Champaign, Illinois, at the University of Illinois, they have a, an outfit called the Morrow Plots, where they have plots that have been actually farmed since the late 1850s. And uh, those, those plots, as you can tell, the organic matter has dropped from about 4% when they started that experiment to under 2% now. And uh, that make those soils very different. That's when you go from that black soil to that sticky yellow clay. So on some of those plots, they've started no-tilling, and, and you can actually bring that organic matter back up in those soils, and that's what the canes have done. They brought the organic matter in their soils back up to a better level where the soils handle differently. How those soils get different, we'll show with a couple demonstrations. But what happens? When you do tillage, you do a couple things on the soil. You get a soil that has primarily bacteria. So you flip that soil over with a moldboard plow. Organic matter that's in there gets exposed to oxygen. It burns off, the organic matter content goes down. And you get a soil that has primarily bacteria in there. They're fast burning, the organic matter goes away. You put fertilizer on there, the fertilizer is immediately available to the crop. But these bacteria are not very good in holding our soil particles together. And again, we'll show that to you in a minute. So, you end up with soils that seal easier, and sealing is the process where raindrops hit the soil and then put a crust on top of them. You get more runoff because of that, and you get more compaction. And that's, that surprises a lot of people. Well, I did a bunch of tillage to get rid of compaction. Well, the sad thing about tillage is, by tillage you get more compaction, so you do more tillage, so you get more compaction, and now you're in this vicious cycle where you get a really muddy soil. And a beautiful example was that the fall of uh, 2009, I just, I've been out of Indiana for a number of years. I've been dealing with uh, rice and cotton and then a couple of years with peas, lentils and barley. And now I came back to corn and beans. So I spent a bunch of time on the combine with farmers the fall of 09 to get back into the swing of things for corn and soybeans. And that was not the best year to do that because it was a very, very wet fall. And the farmers had a hard time getting the crops out. And time and again, I was mainly on the combine with no-till farmers and these guys were just running while the neighbors were shut down. And so we talked about that, and it turns out in these no-till situations, you have, you, your soils are somewhat dense, more compaction it says there, the roots don't care about that, but you can drive on those soils while the neighbors were slopping through it axle deep in the mud. So that's the difference even with the guys starting to no-till now in these soils. And on top of that, we disturb soil pores, and that is what earthworms and crops do not like, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. So in a no-till soil, you get primarily fungi or molds. 
And that is what is kind of natural. I'll never forget, I had a no-till farmer from Kansas come to my office at Kansas State University, and he said, I think I'll need to do a little bit of tillage here. Because look, he had a soil sample, he broke open a, an aggregate, and it was all white and moldy on the inside. He said, I think I need to do some tillage. My soil is all getting moldy. Well, that's beautiful, I said. That's what you want. You don't want to get rid of that mold. That's exactly what you need. If you go to a fence row that has not been worked for a long time, you look in pasture soils, you go in a forest soil that's never been worked, there are a lot of molds in those soils, and that's a good thing. You want those in there. They help you decompose the residue. They're very good at binding soil particles together. That's why those soils are so much better. They can actually even compete with pathogens. And why my university colleagues come up with these names that I cannot pronounce nor spell, I don't know, but they're called mycorrhizae. And um, the, some of those mycorrhizae, the arbuscular mycorrhizae, have a thing called fungal hyphae. And what that means is you get little white threads through the soil. Those fungi grow out. And actually, it's really interesting. Um, if you are asked, what is the largest living organism on Earth? I thought elephant, and I thought, no, 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 whale. It's got to be a whale. Largest organism on Earth. It's not. It's a group of trees in Colorado that goes over several miles that are literally connected with those little fungi that grow from one root of the tree to another root of the tree and they exchange nutrients and signals through those from tree to tree to tree. So it's, it's an organism that's miles and miles long where they're all connected throughout the soil. To explain those mycorrhizae a little bit, on your left here you see a little root going into the soil, so let's say corn root. That little root only has access to water and nutrients in that little layer, that little water layer you see around that root. So if it gets dry, that, that little root is out of, out of luck. This is in what you get uh, primarily in a tillage situation in most of our farmer's fields. Now, if you would leave that alone and the mold start growing in your soil, you get a system like this. All those little branches you see are those mycorrhizae that actually grow into the corn root. And the corn root will then give, get water and nutrients from the mycorrhiza in exchange for sugars. So it's a beneficial relationship to both the root and to the mycorrhiza. But as you can tell now, the area where the plant has access to water and nutrients has dramatically increased. Now this is a primitive picture of a guy that never went to art school. But if we actually take pictures of it, you can see it too. On the top left, or top right picture there, that's a weed seed link. And all those little white threads are those mycorrhizae growing in there. So they are actually supplying water beyond the little shield that you normally have around the uh, uh, seedling. Look at the bottom picture there. You can see that dark thing is the actual seedling. All these threads coming out are the mycorrhizae that work together with that seedling. So you dramatically increase the area where you can get to nutrients and where you can get to water. This is one of the reasons that in a year like 2012, when it was really dry, no-till crops were standing up a lot longer in the drought than tilled crops because they had that bigger area that they could get to water. The coolest thing about stopping some of this tillage is in soil biology, if you do less disturbance, you get a major increase in earthworms out there. And it uh, might take a couple of years for that to happen. And, and earthworms is kind of an interesting topic. You have uh, little red wigglers in the soil that are native, but uh, the big guys that we all know, the night crawlers, the Lubricus, Lubricus terrestris, the big guys, they're illegal aliens. They came in with the settlers from Europe, and uh, in most places uh, they do a lot of good to our soils. There are a couple ecosystems that kind of act like the kutsu in the south, and that's a sad thing. The only place I know where those guys are not doing any good, the, the big night crawlers, is in the boundary waters of Minnesota. They, uh, they have a very, very delicate ecosystem out there. A lot of folks go out there, canoe for 10 days, they bring fishing worms, they go fishing, they get fish, they're done, they dump their fishing worms on the forest floor. These, these uh, night crawlers are such prolific eaters, they've bared whole areas of the forest floor. They just eat that stuff up and the natural ecosystem can deal with it. In our farm fields, in our orchards, in our pastures, those things do fabulous work. They can help us improve the water quality by, uh, the, by in infiltrating water in there, but where it infiltrates, it's in those tunnels that have these organic sites that the earthworms have created. And they eat an enormous amount of crop residue, these worms, which is kind of interesting. Um, us soil scientists, we lead very exciting lives. So at night, we sometimes go in the field with video cameras to see what earthworms are doing. 
So instead of hanging in the bar, this is a whole different uh, thing we're doing. This is actually a video from a group of uh, Canadian researchers that went into the field with uh, video cameras, uh, low light video cameras. And you can see those earthworms are grabbing entire corn leaves and dragging them over their hole. It's not that they take little bites out of it, they take those whole big corn leaves, pull them over their hole, and start wrapping around and building a little thing we call a midden. On the bottom of this uh, last shot, you see the, the corn leaf that's all wrapped around there on the top of the video? So they're building basically a thing called a midden. They do that for a couple of reasons. When an earthworm comes out of its hole, it's very susceptible to Mr. Robin. Not a good life choice. So they do this at night when it's moist enough to do this. They anchor themselves in the hole, come out, grab those corn leaves, pull them over, or whatever leaves they can get, and make these little towers that also shed off rainwater. So it's protection. You have your lunch right there laying on top of you, and uh, you don't have to come out of your hole that much. So these worms can have enormous amounts of residue removed in no time. And now next time you go into a farmer's field or a place where you know there are a lot of earthworms, look for these things, these little piles of crop residue that the earthworms have put together. If you look at a, at a field scale, this is what it looks like. Now look at this field. Again, this is Canada. Soybeans have been harvested. Corn is not off yet. So I would imagine it's only been a couple of weeks at the most that the beans have been off. And look at all the residue. It's all piled in little places out there. And each one of those little piles, if you lift them up, there'd be a hole underneath it where an earthworm lives. Earthworms can be up to 20 years old, uh, and they often live eight years or more in one of those tunnels. And they go up and down in those tunnels with the water and the temperatures of the soil. If it gets really dry, they do the coolest thing. They roll up in a really tight ball after they've made a little hole in the soil that they've basically plastered off so the humidity stays high in there, and they can hibernate like that for years. That's why if you are in a no-till time or in a tilt situation and you stop tilling, the earthworm populations come up pretty rapidly because you've got the seeds basically in the soil already. And seeding earthworms doesn't do you any good. Yes, you can go buy barrels of, of uh, bait worms if you want to and put them in your field. If the field conditions aren't right, they'll just ball up and sit there and wait for the conditions to be right and come out. They ate an enormous amount of residue. The Canadians here had those two screens so the residue wouldn't blow away. And then in the spring they lifted them up and that's what was left of all that heavy, hard corn residue. And you see all those little holes in the surface here where those earthworms have pulled the residue into their holes and taken care of. Now, about 15, 20 years ago when I worked at Kansas State, I doubled a little bit in earthworm stuff. And we had a couple big plexiglass boxes built in this frame here. And the box boxes all got layers of soil in there. I collected different colored soils all from around campus, put them in there so you could just see the differentiation. In the box on the right, we put, uh, I think, four or five night crawlers, and then we waited a couple of months, and sure enough, you can see they, uh, they started tunneling all throughout the soil, and on top, we had lawn clippings. We put fresh lawn clippings on there, and we had the earthworms, we had to keep putting lawn clippings on there. On the other side, nothing happened. So, tunneling, mixing the soil up, and actually, after a while, it almost looked like a topsoil, where they had all mixed it up on, on the top of that thing. Again, you see all those tunnels going through there. They pull the residue in, and on the left of the picture, you can see that where they excrete some of the soil. And they built those, they started to build a little bit of those middens. But they had so much residue here, they didn't need to build middens because they were hidden underneath that. The thing that really surprised me about, uh, about this, this thing was sitting in a dark closet in the university, about 70 degrees most of the time, and we rolled it out if we wanted to show it to people, because you want to keep it in the dark. Number one, to keep the worms against the windows. Number two, it turns all green and slimy if you have it sitting in the light, because it's more soil. So we, uh, we, uh, I figured these, these things are going to dry out. I need to put some water on there. And I put a quart of water on uh, both of those profiles. And the thing that really surprised me is on the left, all the grass started floating. And all that water was just sitting on the soil surface and nothing happened. On the left, I poured the same amount of water on there and it shot right into the ground. What well, kind of makes sense, those earthworms have poked holes so the water can go in. What did surprise me is the next day I came back and on the one on the left, about half the water had run out the drain off the bottom. On the right, no water had come out. Not only did the earthworms make it easier for the water to go into the ground, they also created all the space for the water to actually stay in the ground and hang there and be available for if you want to grow crops from there. Earthworms are pretty cool. So we could do a whole lecture on those. They're very good. So most of our soils are not the great soils that grandpa and great grandpa had anymore. They degraded. 
that gives us issues with crops. Now, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, this guy. It can be. We, I have yields that are about twice what Grandpa had, and things are much better on the farm than they used to be in the 30s. Yeah, we have introduced an enormous amount of technology. The genetics we have in our current crops is very different. The top yields, wheat yields, in the Great Plains used to be 10 bushel to the acre when the, when the dust storms hit. Those guys can pull up to 90 bushels off right now. Much better genetics. We have put inputs in there, fertilizers, we're herbicides, we're much better at controlling weeds, so we've done all sorts of things to make our crops good, but in the process, our soils have gotten worse than they used to be, and that's gonna come up with us now. Number one, we have environmental issues. You heard Colleen just tell about the little bit of residue, soil sediment that goes into some of our rivers. We all know about Lake Erie and how wonderful that is doing in some of our summers we have right now. And then, of course, we have the big plume at the Gulf of Mexico, the, the, the anaerobic zone out there, the dead zone, they call it. So we, we have some impact on our environment, what we do in here with the farms. Now, on the soils itself, can you actually tell the difference, like whether soil is good or bad? Uh, like I said, we, we, we really use, consider the soils, the, all the erosion, runoff, compaction, and crusting we have on there as normal. That's just what our soils are like. The raindrops splash those soils around. They uh, make seals on the soil. When they dry out, we call them a crust. And sometimes those crusts are so hard that our emerging crops cannot get through them. And actually, sandy soils do this a lot worse than clay soils. So you get these soils where the little seedlings can't come through. If we would have had some protection on there, either in the form of a cover crop or residue out there, that wouldn't happen. And uh, one, the thing that really surprises me about erosion is that it is not just on the steep rolling hills of some of the areas that we have around in the Midwest here. This is a field in Elkhart County, which is just butting up almost against the lake a little west of us here. And um, the, in the middle, you see a fence row. That, uh, that is at a certain height. On the right is a no-till field that is just a little lower. On the left is a tilled field, and you see that several inches lower, even on top of where the ridges are out there. So even on this flat land, we've lost a lot of soil, both through organic matter, some through wind erosion, and some through water erosion, even though we're almost flat on these fields out here. So we still lose soil on some of those. A good way to demonstrate that is my little rain simulator I'm gonna show for you here. Um, what this thing is, sitting on the table here, and uh, I'll turn on the camera for you so you can see a little better, hopefully. Look at that, it's even working. Huh? I love technology when it works. I've been in so many meetings and then the technology isn't working, you look like a total dweeb. <laughs> So don't, don't rely on it. You know that well as a farmer. I know a lot of farmers have GPS, but they still have that little arm on the planner just in case the military decides to shut it down and put the marker back up. To <laughs> Backup system. So what are you looking at here? We have some, they're basically uh, stainless steel bread pans, and we hammer those into the soil, and then we put a, uh, a screen underneath it so we can have our soil sample in here, and that's what you're looking at, two of those. And those were taken side by side across the fence from each other. We, uh, we have two soils here. These are from Indiana, from central Indiana. And uh, on the one side, this is from one of my colleagues uh, from his farm. And uh, he farms on the side. He's doing the kind of fun stuff we're doing. And he is a no-till farmer. He's been no-tilling for about 10, 15 years. And he, uh, you know what, I should just put that in front of the camera and you can, everybody can see it. Uh, and I don't have to walk around. So you can see he has uh, a lot of residue out there. Again, his soils, you can, uh, they can drain on the bottom if they want to. Now his neighbor, we can't mention names here, that's why I'm not telling you which colleague this is. His neighbor is not doing that. His, ne his neighbor is in what the NRCS calls a conservation system. And this is what that looks like. So these are taken about 30 or 40 feet apart, these two samples, same landscape position. Oh, by the way, a little side note here. See how I keep my system uh, flat? I hear that you guys are really into wines around here. So uh, you got to drink wine to do this little demonstration. So we're gonna do a, uh, a rainstorm on these two fields, these undisturbed soil samples that we took. 
And I did this yesterday for another meeting, so the soils are very wet. So we had rain last night, and now we get rain again. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, it's a sad situation. <laughs> so what we have here is our rainwater. This is just distilled water in both bottles. Hey, naked farming girl, why don't you come help me with this thing here? You've all seen her shirt, right? Pretty cool. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so we, the, nothing, uh, you know, I really rely on technology, so we have some very high tech here. This is our rain simulator, Tupperware with holes. Seems to work, so we're going to unleash a horrible rainstorm on those two fields, Colleen. And uh, you get to do the neighbor's field, I get to do the colleague's field. You ready? Let it rain. You guys in the front row get to see it a little bit. Oh, whoa, whoa, neighbor, 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 where's your soil going? Where's your, where's your water going? I told you they're wet, so the no-till one is running off too. Thank you, Colleen. I'm going to have you back in a minute here. But So, these raindrops falling from 10,000 feet exert an enormous amount of energy on the soil. Raindrops splash, well, I guess five inches is enough to actually do this already. So when uh, the amount of water in the bottles is to this line on the uh, on the little beaker on the bottom here. So the neighbors basically lost most of his rainwater. So we had a nice little uh, half inch rainstorm, came down fairly fast, and uh, the neighbor lost all of it. And then of course, on top of just losing the water, the neighbor lost a bunch of soil there. And that's what Colleen and the people are finding to keep out of the river. So the no-till situation, <laughs> oh, we're leaking. That's good. So a lot of water stayed in. Where did the rest of the water go? Well, some of it stayed in the soil. But if you look on the side here, oh, that's not good. There's water in the bottom here. It's actually drained through the. You see that? Oh, there. Let me get that bin for you here. This bin that was underneath. See, there's some water in here. So some of the water actually went through the soil. So even though that is, is wet, some of the water can infiltrate in those no-till soils. Now this is really cutesy, I mean, you do it in front of an audience, it works. Uh, you can do this with greenhouse flats for the kids at the high school with uh, sprinkling cans, which just as well. This just folds up nicely in a suitcase so it can haul it around the country. So this is a little rain simulator demonstration, but you know, as a farmer you go like, yeah, you can fit this if you want to, sure. Put hairspray in one of them, boy, it goes really well. You can do all sorts of stuff, but honestly, those were just taken out of the field. We uh, we do this in uh, different oh, we do this in different ways too. Let's see technology again. So this is what you just looked at. I did this at home to show you too, but you get the same thing every time you do it. I've had them in uh, these uh, in these these boxes drying out for months and you pull them out and you do it and it always works. Now, we used to do a lot of this stuff in the field and still do to a certain extent. This is a little rain simulator that uh, I bring with me and we go across farmers farms. What happened here, this is in Rensselaer, this is basically uh, almost south of Chicago. Uh, we had a field that was in winter wheat, had a cover crop on it, and on this little square, and it was, they had manure put on, they tilled up the whole field, and then they put a, uh, the cover crop on. Uh, we took the cover crop away in this 5 by 10 area and put the rain simulator on it to see what would happen. And I'm a terrible cameraman, I apologize for that. But this is what happened in the first 60 seconds. It was dry. See, it's in front of the corn, corn harvest, so this is probably in October. And the rain starts on, we we're putting two and a half inches of rain on. And actually there's a little bit of science to this. Those nozzles were developed to actually get the same size and shape of raindrops that come out in a two and a half inch per hour rainstorm. And the pressure with which we push them onto the surface makes it almost like natural rain come from a great height. I'm going to get you guys seasick before lunch here, but sorry about that. But you see, about half a minute in and the whole soil is already getting shiny. And it took us less than three minutes to get full runoff from that plot on the side, just like I showed you with those little beakers here. And uh, the one on the left, we ran out of water. An 80-gallon water tank out there, we put uh, over two inches of water on the left, and we ran out of water, and there was still no runoff. So even this field is in tillage. They applied manure, 
just putting a cover crop on there made the difference of creating runoff or not and making the water go in there. So cover crops are not just for the no-till guys. Now, when I worked at Kansas State, we had a, yeah, I like this machine a lot too. This, uh, this was the machine I had at Kansas State. This had much better bragging rights. This is a 6,000 pound trailer that uh, looked like a horse trainer going around and squirting on big plots in farmer's fields. But it took a half a day to set up. I like this much better. I carried this in this morning. The little one I have takes me half an hour to set up. Now, for those of you who've been around for a while, the first year we used this was 1993. You guys remember 1993, the year of the floods. So I'm driving along the interstate in Kansas with a big machine that proudly on the back says, Kansas State University Rain Simulator. And it is raining buckets and everything is flooding. I learned a lot of sign language. That, you know. <laughs> so, that infiltration is big, it's very big. Even if you just go to a field, a conventional tilled field, and look at all the residue we have on there, on the left hand side, you put one of those irrigation pipes that we uh, have, uh, have cut through, hammer it in the soil a little bit, put water in there, and it'll sit there. On a no-till field, most of it will go immediately into the ground. Look at the difference in infiltration rate. The reason is that if we leave those soils alone, alone the aggregates will come back together again because the organic matter is helping us with that. Those molds, those fungi are helping us with getting that stuff, holding it together. So another way to look at these soils and how well they work and how well they operate is a thing called the slave test. Again, we, we've gone for the very high-tech demonstrations here for you today. So, uh, Colleen, can you help me with this one again? And this white sheet is just so you can see it, so there's a clear background. So we have beakers here with, uh, can we get them away? Get the camera started. Okay, so we have four beakers here that have distilled water in it, a little piece of hardware cloth, and then we're going to dunk some soils in there just to show you. The first one, and I didn't even take one of my babies, we'll do that same soil from uh, Indiana that I just showed you. Break off a little piece here. I'll take a cloth for this one. So I made you make your cloth right size, and then you can make mine right size this morning. Yeah, yours are really, yeah, your plots are big, right? It's okay. So, we have that same soil again. My colleague, no tilling, and his neighbor. So, yeah, you rain on it, you get this erosion and stuff, that's cool. How about we just quietly put them into the soil, see what happens. Now, wait a minute, there's a, quite a difference there. Again, these soils were taken from the field, and then we air dried them, and I've just been carrying them around in Ziplocs, and that's all we did to these soils. So this is the same soil type, same landscape position, like I said, about 40 feet from each other taken. You see the water is going in both clods. You see the air bubbles coming out. And that is what's happening. As the water rushes into those clods from all directions, the air pressure in this clod goes up and the air bubbles can escape, but in some places it cannot escape because the air pressure goes up. And that soil on the left that has a lot of fungi in there, a lot of those glues, actually keeps the soil together. The one on the right, doesn't do it very well, because we've been tilling that, even though it's not a full till, full till system, this is really a conservation tillage system, and you see that the particles are just starting to fall to the bottom. So they, the, the glues are, there's not enough glue there to hold those soil particles together. Now think about it from a practical matter. It's a little wet in the fall, you have to get in your field to get the crop out, like 2009. What soil do you want to be driving on? The one on the tilled soil will just make big, big ruts, the one on the left, it leaves cleat marks, but it'd be still there. So, farmer a couple months ago said, yeah, you put hairspray around the other one, right? So that the water can go in and it's dry. At the end of the presentation, we'll take this one out of the water and I'll show you, you can actually break it open. You can see it's all wet, but it's still a clot. If I try to lift this little rack out, the whole thing is gonna go to the bottom. So this is Indiana stuff, but in Michigan it goes much better, right? So you have two soils here. Yeah, it doesn't always work. This is technology, live meetings, you know how it goes. They worked last night, right? They worked last night. Yeah, I've been in front of 500 farmers doing this and it didn't work and I had no explanation for it. So, so what do we got here, Colleen? We got a no-till soil, okay? Do you know the soil type? I think it's like a, a sandy loam. Sandy loam, okay. Well, why don't you put them in, see what happens. Yeah, I'll do the no-till, since I'm a no-till guy. I can't break this one out anymore because it's so like... Just hammer it in there. Oh, it falls apart, right? So, 
Wow, this is Michigan soil. See, Michigan soil is much better than Indiana soil. <laughs> but you see bubbles coming out, so the water is definitely going. It's awesome. It's really good. What you do? Cook it in the microwave for half an hour or so? Yeah, we, you can, the only thing you need to do is air dry, so that the water actually goes in. And you can do this with any soils. Uh, we've done it in uh, soils from all states. And, and now, the, some, sta some soils are worse than other soils in doing this. I think it's pretty impressive what's happening with your soils here. So, Thanks for getting those for me, Colleen. That's good. I actually, maybe over lunch or the next when we're splitting up the sessions, I have some uh, soil from Lanawick County here. That looks like powdered sugar when you put it in. It goes poof. It goes right through the through the little rack here. So, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so we'll let that go while uh, while we do the rest of the presentation. And uh, so what you looked at basically, these are some soils from the southeast. These are the Piedmonts, uh, where they have some serious uh, erosion issues. Look what those soils do. That just completely disintegrates. And, uh, so it's pretty, pretty amazing. Again, same thing. On the right is vegetable uh, acres that really get a tilt a bunch of times a year, rototilt and that kind of stuff. On the left is a guy that had pasture rotation, all that kind of stuff. So the main reason that happens again, when you till the soil, you have mainly bacteria that don't hold the soil together very well. If you don't do that much tillage, you have more fungi, more earthworms, and the soils are held together much, much better. Farmers are much smarter about this than I am. You know, I need to hold water around and all that stuff. This is a picture a farmer gave me. He uh, took some particles from the tilled soil, and these are actually nice rotations. This is a corn, wheat, hay, corn, no-till corn rotation, and the other one is the same rotation, but they use tillage. So there's actually pasture in some of these, uh, some of these rotations. He mixed up about uh, half water, half green paint he had left in the shed, latex paint, then he got some uh, particles from a no-till field and from a tilled field. He dried them out, dumped them for two minutes in the water and paint mixture, dried them out again, broke them open. And look, if you look on the left, you see that no green paint is in the particles that came from a tilled field. The ones that came from a no-till field are completely filled with paint in there. So the water went much better in there and stayed in there in those clots. I thought that was pretty interesting how he did that. So the big question is, how do we get from the sticky yellow stuff the stuff that's falling apart on us, if we just put it in water, to that stuff that has a lot more organic matter in there and actually holds up to uh, what, we, uh, what we're doing with it, when we drive on it, when we grow crops on it and all that. Well, in Indiana, we have a pretty cool project. We have a uh, project where we have five of the university research farm across the state working with us, and then also 12 farmers, private farmers, and we are actually looking on their farms, so what is different about your soil? These, most of these guys are no-till farmers. And actually, we have one in the room here, Jamie Scott, who's been in the county here numerous times. Uh, here he's in Indiana. We're about here in uh, Pawpaw and or, or in Lawrence. And so we're, we're about here. Jamie is here in the north end of the state. And, uh, well, he didn't know we'll go that far, but it's the top, the top uh, triangle in there that's getting his farm. We're uh, doing measurements on those farms, and in uh, some of those fields we're going to introduce cover crops in addition to what the farmers are doing now, and hopefully in three to five years we come back and measure the soil again. So we can do these little cutesy tests, but how do you put a number on that? Yeah, this is good, this is better, that's best. Of those four ones, how do you rank them? It's very hard to come up with an indicator for soil health, especially since we're dealing with different soils. Soil bumps, sandy lumps, all that kind of stuff. So there's a couple of commercial tests out there. There's the earth for test that is done in uh, Michigan. And what those guys actually do is they uh, go in and they look through a microscope and actually count the craters in the soil. So they look at uh, nematodes, the good ones, the bad ones. They look at fungi, they look at uh, bacteria. So they all classify that stuff and write it down for you. What you have in your soil. Issue with that is I'm not, I don't know what I'm supposed to have. So I get this great report back that tells me you got all this. And I can go ooh or ah, but I don't know whether it's good or bad. So that's what we're learning right now. And we're talking to those guys on a regular basis. And these guys get a lot of samples from organic farmers and from no-till farmers that are really interested in their soil. So we can maybe compare it to some of theirs. Then there is Ward's Labs out of Nebraska. Now, I'm an engineer by training. I like what those guys did. Well, that's kind of a brute method. So when you look at all the, the, the critters we have in our soils, they have fatty acids in them. And a fatty acid is basically a chain of carbon molecules with water or hydrogen stuck on the sides. 
that's how you get you saturated, partially saturated. You read it on the labels with all your food stuff. What they figured out is that every critter, whether it's a nematode or a bacterium or a fungi, has a certain length of those chains. So by measuring the length of those chains, they can figure out how many of those critters you have in your soil. Now, how do you do that? Well, you can't go out there with a ruler if the microscope is already ridiculously expensive. That's a $120 test per soil sample. So what do those guys do? They take the soil sample, they grind the heck out of it. They use some chemicals in there, so only the fatty acids are left in there. Then they run it through a machine. It's called a gas chromatograph. And they go through long coils, the, the, the ground up sample of the soil. And the ones that have the shortest samples go through pretty quick. Because they, they go, and the ones with the longest samples take a long time to get through that machine. On the other end is a meter where they meet what's coming out of this thing. So you see these peaks coming out of the machine. And based on the peaks, you can basically tell you what you got in your soil. We have so many with short chains and so many with long chains, and they've, they've classified this on known soil samples and known samples, so they know what they're looking at when it's coming through the machine. So they give you a whole report card on what you have based on what those fatty acids tell you, and it's very repeatable, and it only costs 30 bucks. So you can do it quicker, and you get about the same sample. Too bad for the microbes you had in your soil there, they're not happy about that, but those soil samples weren't going to come back to your field anyhow. Then Cornell University in New York are doing a mix of physical, like both density and texture of your soil, biological, where they measure some of those things, and then chemical. And those tests are about uh, also about $100. The biological, they actually take your soil and they plant a little seed in it and measure how quickly it grows in there under standardized uh, greenhouse conditions. So it's kind of interesting. And then Solvita is a new one that's getting a lot of attention because it's real easy. You can do it in the field. You take sample, do a couple things with it. You throw some dye in there, you get a color, and you have a color chart, and you can combine it to it. And uh, it measures the mineralizable, mineralizable nitrogen plus phosphorus and potassium and a couple other things. And we, like I said, uh, earlier this week, we were on the phone with all those four labs for four hours to just come up with, okay, what do our samples will tell us? Because we've taken them from those 12 farms to the five university farms. And the university farms are an interesting bag. Um, actually, I should have put that picture up there from the university farm. I've worked for universities for 15 years. See, people think of corporation. That's, that's one massive thing, and you can kick against it and be angry at it. University, they don't do, but there's not much difference. It's just a bunch of people that work in buildings, have their opinions, do their things. So if you look at a research station in the state of Indiana, the ones on the north, south side of the state, where it's roly-poly going to the Ohio River, those are all in no-till. And all the research they do is on no-till and keeping that soil on those slopes. The guys on the north side that are living on those nice, dark, flat soils. They plow the heck out of all their research stations. So we have a great example there where we can compare no-till versus non-no-till. So if we introduce no-till in these systems, then we can actually see what the changes are and again what our soil samples are telling us. So that is a kind of our check, and we're glad Purdue is working with us on that stuff. Okay, so our soils. There is a difference in how we treated them and how we can treat them from now on, after we've been in Tupol for a couple decades. No-till helps to heal the soil or backing off on the amount of tillage we do, but what else can we do? Our corn and bean rotations are not very diverse, although you heard from the guy in Elkhart County, they have hay in rotation still, which is not very common. Most of us don't even have wheat anymore. Last couple of years, corn prices were really good. What are farmers doing? Corn, 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 corn. Very diverse, right? Same roots every year, same herbicides every year, not, not same fertilizer every year. Not necessarily good for the soil. So, corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. That's a little better, uh, again. We can actually not grow other stuff financially well, unless you're in, in a horticultural situation, or you can actually put pastures in there. It's all about the finances that it's hard to get out of this corn soybean rotation. So cover crops can actually help us make a change there. Now we can add a whole different crop into those acres to, to do something different. So what is a cover crop? You guys have lots of acres here, so now we need to speed through some of this stuff. Something you grow between corn and soybeans, and I know not yet between the rows of corn and the rows of soybean, although we're working on that one too. Companion cropping, didn't we know about that about 50 years ago that worked really well? We're reinventing the wheel, cool. Anyhow, 
So, often planted after the corn or soy harvest, although where you are, as far north as you are, oftentimes we have to put those in the standing corn and soybeans to actually get them to do what we want them to do, because there's not a lot of growing season left. Yeah, like now, I still have colleagues taking out the corn right now. Down corn after the storms we had last week. Any corn left in the ground here? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's some corn left, okay. What are you doing here? Oh, it's raining, okay, I have a yeah. So, what can we use for those cover crops? Well. We're using a warm season grass, beans, or a corn, and then we have a legume, our soybeans. So we need to find things that are different groups that fit in there. So we can use grasses, cool season or warm season grasses. We have annual ryegrass and cereal rye up here that work fairly well. And I'm surprised that after five, six years of those cover crops being used all over the place that people still are confused about what annual ryegrass and cereal rye is. I don't know who came up with those names that was ultimately stupid. But they're too close. So annual ryegrass is like your long cereal rye. It's like wheat. And you, you totally treat them differently and you put them in different places in your rotation. We can use brassicaceae like the turnips and the radishes. Uh, we'll, we'll show you some pictures of that. And legumes like clovers and peas we can put between corn and uh, beans. And mixes of those. We find that actually if you start mixing that stuff together, they do better than if you do just one or the other. So, Jamie, you had a mix that had 13 things in there on your farm. Man, it looked like a jungle, but it was growing beautifully. Most of it will die out, and it's, it's easy to kill, and then the next crop goes in there. So now we have some diversity in the crop rotation, stuff to eat for the earthworms. Why do we even mess with this cover crop? Weed control. There are a lot, and again, we're re reinventing the wheel. You can actually shade out cover crops. Okay. Uh, confession time. I used to work for Monsanto for a number of years as a no-till specialist. Those guys make herbicides, so that's where they make their money. First lesson we learned when we went through Monsanto school was shading out is much more effective than herbicides. So they take the soybean field that was grown up very nicely, mowed out a row, came back three weeks later, nothing but weeds out there. Where you had the nice shady canopy of the soybeans, no weeds growing out there. We knew that. We've known this for a long time. But we got away from it. So we can do weed control. We have some weeds that are very hard to control with herbicides. So mare's tail. And now a dandy, dandy nice weed coming out of the south called Palmer amaranth. Makes a million seeds in the plant. It grows like five feet a day. That thing is just a nightmare. It actually grows about five inches a day. It's, it's really scary to see that. Your weed control on that thing, if you're off by two days, you can't control it. Because it goes from this to this in two days and your herbicide can get it anymore. It's, it's a scary thing, it's out there. You can shade it out with some of our cover crops and actually sort of control it. 2012, big drought. In Indiana we had about half a yield to most of our cornfields. However, in the spring it was wet so we put 100% of the nitrogen on. Half a corn crop to less than half the nitrogen out there, a lot of nitrogen left. If you leave your field bare all winter long, and wait for the next year to grow it, that nitrogen is long gone. It's in the lake, it's in the air, you paid for it by the pounds, but it's gone, most of it. So you can actually tie that up with some of those cover crops. You can produce nitrogen, although we are too far north really to do that. Forage for hay or grazing, the risk management agency, thanks to guys like Jamie going to Springfield and talking to those guys and explaining what cover crops are, they now let us hay and graze some of those cover crop fields. So you fly grass into your corn or your beans, and then as soon as the corn or beans are off, those grasses grow, you can either hay or graze them in the fall, and then maybe some more hay or grazing in the spring. So there's a potential revenue source. What you're basically doing is you take the nutrients, and instead of carrying them over to the next crop, you carry them into a cow and you're making protein. So again, you don't lose the nutrients. And the erosion protection, because you have the fields covered, that's wonderful. But think about it. How many months out of the year are we using that soil? I talked to a group of farmers yesterday, they said most farmlands now going for over 10,000 bucks an acre. I went to an auction two weeks ago in Indiana, it went for uh, 11 7 I think, per acre. You've all read in the farm press about the little uh, auction they had in Illinois, where they, Jimmy Johns and uh, Beck Seed started bidding against each other and they ended up with 14.9 per acre. With three dollar corn, that really pays, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't get the finances on this thing. But anyhow, farmland's very expensive. How many months out of the year do we use that expensive farmland? Five months, right? Going corn or soybeans, that's about it. What do you do the other seven months? Pay taxes, fight weeds, right? Not a very good use of a very expensive resource out there. 
in those seven months, there's still a lot of solar energy going on there, and we can actually grow stuff. Not corn, not soybeans. Last week, northern Indiana was in a field. Look at all the greenery out there. Corn and soybean fields look very different now. This was after wheat, so this is fit, you know, a lot of growth out there. But I'll show you some corn and bean fields too. So where we normally would be fighting weeds and not making any money on the fields, here's a lot of stuff growing. And it's not so much what's growing on top of what's happening below to our soils. So we're actually building a better soil by catching that solar energy. Now granted, after seven months, there's going to be two months when you guys are in the lake effect and you've got this much snow, not much happening. Although, I have to tell you, a couple of years ago, we had big snow cover, even in central Indiana. As soon as that snow came off, there was growing green grass coming up already. It's amazing. Weeds, same thing, you know that. So there's stuff happening in those other months. So what cover crops should we use? Uh, there's a couple of resources. Your, uh, your districts and NRCS have, uh, have access to this. We have a website called ccsin.org, conservation cropping systems indiana.org. We have a cover crop model that was developed by uh, the land grant universities in the Midwest. We have some videos about how to incorporate cover crops, and we have some books and articles about cover crops on that website. There's also a neat blog out there. A blog is basically just a guy being bored and putting stuff on the internet. But this is, uh, this is an agronomist out of Wisconsin, and he drives through the whole Midwest, and he has cover crop plots everywhere. He shoots little videos when he goes to one of his cover crop plots, and he puts those online. And uh, he annotates what happens. Sometimes he digs a pit, and it's really cool. Uh, it's actually a neat one. Now, this cover crop model, if you type in on the top, you can see Michigan, and I put Van Buren County in there. The model returns a table for you. And the table on the top has the calendar from February to February. And then on the left-hand side, you have all the cover crops you can grow. And it goes, starts with the non-legumes, like your buckwheats, and your annual ryegrass, and your winter wheat, and, your, and all those. Then you get the brassicas, like your mustards, and oil seeds, and canolas. Legumes, like your uh, clovers and peas, and then some mixes on the bottom. The green bars indicate when you best can plant those cover crops. And you see some of them can be planted in the summer, so you can use those after wheat, or you can use those in preventive planting acres. But most of the ones to the right, those green bars, are the ones we want to go over winter with, and that will actually not freeze out most of the years. Now this looks all wonderful, until you realize you grow corn most of the time on there. So only the stuff that sticks out on the right hand side, you can actually put in after corn crop in most years, and not even every year out there. That is why we're really looking at putting a lot of cover crops in the standing crop. So we give them a head start, and you get more growth out of those things. Why is that so important? Let's take a crop like annual ryegrass. This was planted on September 15 on the left, and a month later, October 15, when the corn was actually out on the right. And by November 4th, there's 11 inches of growth on the left, 2 inches of growth on the right. More than likely, this stuff is going to freeze out on you, because you don't have enough leaf out there to get a root to actually get it through the winter out there. So big difference. You want to get that head start. You want to have the stuff growing real well. So how do we get it in the ground? We'll go over a couple seeding options. Um, drilling is probably the best. Your district has a drill that you can use if you need to. Uh, you get the best seed to soil contact, or planter is a really good option too. Uh, with planters, you save about half the seed cost because you get the precision planting. And I am surprised what farmers have figured out. Instead of your nice corn and bean seeds and simulate those with there, there's farmer getting those fuzzy grass seeds and everything to go through a planter and plant them in rows on their farms. Popular one is radishes in one row, and then the next 15-inch row over in the bean planter would be Austrian winter peas or something. And uh, you do it every other row, and then some farmers are actually planting their corn exactly on the radish rows. And they get a yield boost out of that. So there's all sorts of things you can do. However, like I said, you want to go into the crop. Uh, oh, this is another method, those, those vertical tillage tools. We can spend a half a day on those. I'm not a big fan of those. They weren't selling a lot of discs anymore, so they're repainted them and now they're selling them as vertical tillers too. Okay, if you want to buy one of those, fabulous. Uh, here's a Phillips Harrow. If I have a half a day section, I've ticked off the whole farming community from one end to the other. I'm just <laughs> equipment guys today. So if you're going to use one of those things, if you really have to spend that $50,000, put a Vollmer seeder, put an air seeder on there and put your cover crop out. 
Here's one of those sulfur things. Uh, if you want to size your residue, cool. Put, put the cover crop on there and get that in the ground. You can cover a lot of acres in the big area out there. There's a couple guys who don't want to have one of those sitting in the farm. This Dutch guy doesn't know anything. So, okay. So, if we want to go into standing crop, if we want to speed this up a little bit and, and get, it, get the cover crops going, there's all sorts of ways to do that. There's a bunch of guys that are using those old detasslers and they're remodeling them. They, they're little and they're not very tall. So you're a little limited in what you can actually get in the crop. A guy from Ohio actually used one. He put uh, tubes on the sides and he can get six rows done at a time. But you see, not a lot of clearance there, not very high. Now, you put a challenge in front of farmers, guess what? They usually take the challenge. So we needed to go higher, right? Okay, leave the farm, a couple of welding torches, we go higher. Here's a couple of guys in, uh, in Indianapolis, who are close to Indianapolis, who took their Hagee, and look how the, the spray rig, look how the engine is sitting, front to back on there. After a winter in the shop, the engine is now sitting sideways, looking at it out there, and they jacked it up a couple of feet, and they go into their corn, they put an air seeder on the back, they go into their corn, and that's how they put their crops on. Of course, central Indiana, this guy went a little higher yet. He took his Hagee and uh, jacked it up, and that's how he's putting cover crops in. And of course, we can go higher. So these guys went a little higher yet. But the absolute winners, and most of you guys have probably seen this picture from the farm press, is the guys in Illinois that built this unit up, and now you need a ladder to get on the ladder to get in the unit. <laughs> so this is basically an airplane that doesn't leave the ground. And, uh, I, I'm an ag engineer by training, and I can just see the warranties go to heck on this piece of equipment. And it looks pretty impressive when they go through the field with that. Very tall corn, they stay completely above it. But my first question was, so what do we do on side hills out there? And guess what, some farmers put that one figured out. So they got a high boy here that can actually go on the side slopes and put the cover crops into the standing corn. So it's really fun to see what those guys do. This is one of our farmers close to uh, Indianapolis who uh, took his uh, Miller sprayer and he set it up in such a way that in about half a day, about four or five hours, he can jerk, jerk, take off the, the herbicide or the fungicide tank, he takes the front boom off, puts a new boom on there, that boom has 1,600 feet of hose on there, drops an air seeder in that same spot his tank was before, and in four or five hours he's planting cover crops instead of putting on fungicides or something else. On the first year, he did 4,000 acres. He did his whole farm, and all the neighbors wanted him to come do cover crops for him. And it looks pretty impressive as he goes through the field. Now, the first thing you think, see, he's not going as high as the Illinois guys. You think, oh man, he's knocking a lot of corn over. And if he's not knocking it over in the straight rows, when he's turning on the ends, that's got to make an enormous mess out of your fields. So we actually look at that. One of our guys actually had one of those things go through a field. And in the turn rows, yeah, you knocked a bunch of stalks over, so they made a whole bunch of assumptions. They counted the stalks over, the ears they found, how many kernels on a ear, blah, 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 did all the math. For a half mile field, it boils down to two bucks an acre loss. So with all that corn, you, you move over there as you turn this thing around, not that big of a loss out there. And uh, that, that is, it, if you have shorter fields, that becomes a big of an issue, of course. Now there's some we talked about going into the standing crops, and there's a bunch of stuff out there. Some of those equipment manufacturers made late side dress applicators. You can actually go in corn that's four feet tall, and you can still put a little nitrogen on there, so you can spoon feed it throughout the season. And uh, this is another brand, has one of those units, and uh, this is in a bean field, but you get the picture. The, uh, the unit will go through corn this big, and they can still put a little nitrogen on there to give that corn the last boost if the weather conditions are right all that. Well, some guys decided, why wouldn't I put cover crops in? So they're putting cover crops in uh, with some of those machines, and then the guys at Penn State have taken this one step further. Of course, this is not commercial yet, but they have a unit out there that does three things. It does a post-plant herbicide application, a nitrogen side rest, and the planting of a cover crop all in one pass. Now, they've had very good luck with it. They've been doing it for five years. They figure if you do those three things all at once, you save $19 an acre over individual trips. They found a seven bushel an acre corn yield boost. They gave themselves 30 bucks for that. And they reduced the nitrogen because they have legumes in those cover crops. If you grow them that early, if you grow them when the corn is about yay high, you have enough growth on the legumes that you actually can get some nitrogen out of them. They took a credit for 32, so they figured they gained about 80 bucks an acre by going with a system like that. Not promoting that yet, 
This is Pennsylvania. Will it work in Michigan? Will it work in Indiana? I want to see a lot more data before we start advertising this. Pretty hip, though, that they're doing this stuff. I know guys that are planting corn and soybeans at the same time. They plant the corn on the 30-inch rows, and they put soybeans right in the middle out there. Now, my whole, my, my whole education goes like, no, don't do that, because I was taught you need to have a nice, clean field and just put the crop that you want to do. Actually, he finds out he gets a boost out of his corn. Corn gets stole, the soybeans kind of go dormant, sit underneath there, don't do much anymore, and he gets a yield boost out of it. Again, one farmer, two years, I want to see a lot more data before we go that direction. One of the very good options, and you guys have done a lot of that, is using airplanes. You go into the standing corn and soybeans, put your cover crops in there, and get them seeded out there. A uh, little caution there, we, we've had some interesting stuff happening. Cover crops is kind of a bonanza or a gold rush right now. We have a lot of airplanes moving into the state and say, oh, we can do that. Take the spray boom off, put a distributor on there for cover crops, and they go fly. So the first couple of years, we had a lot of streaky fields, really streaky fields. We had a lot of neighbors getting free cover crops. <laughs> so and then you have to go and kill them again. So make sure you know who you work with. One of the guys that has worked extensively with the district here is Jamie Scott in the back of the room. He's from North Central Indiana, and he picks his pilots. He's actually a real butt about this whole thing. Pilots get paid by the hour they fly. Jamie will sit there with the seat at the airport and tell the air, uh, airplanes they cannot fly because it's too windy. Pilots don't like that, but he gets great results and his customers are very happy about how the seat is on their farm. So talk to the districts. They, uh, how many acres did you fly on? 10,000 something? Or? We did about 1,000 with the co-op, but total that day, I think Jamie flew on 1,600 acres that day okay. in the area. So you had a lot of acres going on there. Uh, in Indiana, we fly tens of thousands an acre on with airplanes. It works real well. The nice thing is, of course, you don't have to worry about it. You're getting ready for harvest. Somebody else is flying those acres on. And at 10 to 15 bucks an acre, you cannot run equipment yourself, like a drill or a planter, to do that. So some other methods. Some farmers are starting to play with the combine. Here's a guy that has an air seeder on the combine head. Probably won't work here. A little late for you guys to wait that long. He liked it so well that the equipment manufacturer now actually built one for him, and there's a couple of those in the nation. He's dropping the seed right behind the corn header before the residue is coming out of the back of the combine, so you have it nicely covered up. And down south, it works great. I don't know whether that works here. You might be too late in those years to do that. Guys at Michigan State have been working at putting manure and uh, cover crop seed together and knifing it into the field. Great yield boost on the stuff. There's not a lot of equipment like that around to actually do that with. So, but we're actually working with a group of dairy farmers, uh, all Dutch guys, in uh, northern Indiana. We're trying to see whether we can do some of that kind of stuff with them. Future of cover crops. Some guys are actually playing with this stuff. Uh, put a little whirly bird uh, cedar and stick it on the robot. Huh? Works real well. Looks cool. Guess what? Some guy actually did that. It's called the robot. And this was demonstrated in Pennsylvania in a field a couple uh, weeks ago at a field day. This thing is all autonomous. It works on GPS, on RTK. It does its own job. It puts fertilizer down and cover crop at the same time. And uh, it goes to a docking station to fill back up when it's empty. And it's almost there. Right now, when it comes out of the road, they use a remote control and put it into the next row, but they're almost to the point they can do that. And I'm not surprised because you've all seen the videos online where a grain cart is parked on the side of the field, the combine tells it to come, the grain cart without a driver in the tractor comes to the combine, drives next to the combine, and they offload the combine as they go. One of the toughest jobs on the farm, totally automated now. So this thing, I imagine it will work too. Be really cool, although I'd be fairly upset if it come back at the end of the day, if it been working all day, and somewhere in the middle of the day decided to do a 45 degree turn instead of going straight down the roads. It would make a mess out of your field. So I hope to have some safeties on there that doesn't happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see units like that run. You know, I forget how many acres a day they could do with it. I was a little surprised you could get that many acres out of there. And if you don't have to tend to it, who knows? Anyhow, again, I want to see a lot more data before we start pushing this kind of stuff. A couple simple things about cover crops and then we're done. What should you use for a cover crop? The easiest thing is to get a cereal rye into your corn. Either drill it after harvest or fly the cereal rye in. This is a field in Indiana where we did that in 2012. And uh, look at the cereal rye. Remember, 2012, about half the yield, the drought, all that stuff. Can you see the streaks in the cereal rye? Guess how far those streaks are apart? 
30 inches. It's your side dress rose. All the side dress nitrogen you put on there, the corn couldn't get to because it turned too dry. So you would have lost a lot of that, now that cereal rye is taking it up. How much can a cereal rye take up? Well, luckily we have some research from Maryland on that. In the drought of 88, they did the same thing. They planted cereal rye on October 1, October 15, and October 30th, and then they measured every month, all the way through the winter, how much of that nitrogen was actually in the cereal rye. So if you planted your cereal rye October 1st, by March you had 160 pounds of nitrogen in that cereal rye crop. Had you waited a month, you only had 70 pounds in there. Again, planting those cover crops early is really important. So all that stuff would have either gone into water or you would have lost it some other way. Now you're building soil organic matter back with it. Not all of that is available for the next crop. But all that nitrogen is in the roots, it's in plant material, and as that stuff decays, we start building that organic matter. Now you're building organic matter with nitrogen you would have lost anyhow. You don't have to buy nitrogen to build organic matter again. After that, you put uh, beans in, and a lot of our farmers are starting to play with short variety beans. So shorter season beans that actually come out a week or two earlier, so you have two extra weeks to get your cover crop in there. 2012 was not a good year to try to do that. Because it started raining after the short season beans were done, the long season beans still could use some of that rain. Works most years for the guys. Then you put oats and radish either out of an airplane or drill it into your, uh, into your uh, soybean stubble. And the next year you come back with your corn. And now this, if you have done all this basically in no-till, this would be your first no-till corn. But instead of just going cold turkey and no-till corn, You've already done a whole bunch of no-till passes and gotten that soil ready for you to actually be no-tilling corn in there. And like I said, some guys will actually go on the radish rows and they get a yield boost out of that. So radishes and oats, it's a nice beginner mix because the nice thing is it all freezes out. Now these are obviously pictures from south of you or in a really, really perfect year. Drilled September 15, a little late. Growth by November or by October and then by November. I'll show you some more realistic pictures. Some years this happens, not very often that you get this much growth. This is more likely to happen after wheat. But the nice thing is by December, your radishes have had a couple big frosts on there and they're dead. You see they're all white. There's not much left out there. Your oats are dying at that point. They need a little more frost to get killed. By January, your radishes are almost gone and your oats are just providing the cover that you need on the field but there's nothing growing. Next spring you can come in and put your corn in there, there's not much you need to do, a little weed control, and, and you're done. Now as radishes, sometimes they never grow like this around here, unless you're after wheat or, or silage corn. The difference between radishes and some of the other cover crops is that they have these, these roots that go through the soil. This one hit a compacted layer, but it found a, a hole, and on the side of the shelf you can see it still went down. So it went through the compacted layer after it found a, a hole there, your corn and beans usually don't do that. Beans just go 90 degrees and they don't go back down anymore after that. And now you have very shallow rooting system on your beans. So those radishes, how big they get, and those things you can carry in the coffee shop and say, who grew the big radish I grew? That is not the important thing. Really what happens with those radishes, you get these fine roots growing first into the soil and then they start making those tubers. The fine roots is what does the trick. I tried to grow them in boxes a couple of years, and uh, you can see we have annual ryegrass on the left and radishes on the right, and they were at the bottom of those four foot boxes in a couple of weeks. It's amazing how quickly those roots grow on these plants, and I'll show you some field pictures of that too. But it's really the fine rooting system those two crops send out. They scavenge a lot of nitrogen and they break up the soil, and they add a lot of organic matter to your soil out there. And again, they go deep four feet into the soil out there. So the cover crops are really selected for their survivability in the tough weather between corn and bean crops, but it's mainly about the rooting systems they put down and the impression you get there. Yes, we can grow those monster radishes if you put manure on wheat ground, you get those big radishes, boo hoo. So wonderful. But they can take up an enormous amount of nitrogen in those cases, 225 pounds at Ohio State or 168 pounds of nitrogen in those radishes after wheat and after manure. So. Again, that doesn't happen very many times in fields. Here's a corn field on the left and a bean field on the right, and they flew radishes on there. And the radishes in the corn field are much higher because there was a lot of nitrogen left in the corn. Again, so they like that nitrogen, they take that up. This is more of what we normally get. This is last week, northern Indiana, we did 15 soil pits in three days. It was cold. 
And, uh, but we had fun with the farmers. We had about 15 or 20 farmers at each of the soil pits. These were all fields where the district had uh, cost shared on, uh, on cover crops. And uh, we, we looked at those fields and the farmers were not very happy. Because they either had cost share or not. If you didn't have cost share, you spent 20, 25 bucks plus on seed, plus another 10, 15 on an airplane flying it on for you. And you drive by your field and you see that, and you go like, whoa, that was well spent money. Well, so we dug some holes in the ground. A lot of fields, bean fields, look like this. Nice and streaky, Jamie. They did a good job here, didn't they? Not. So, um, still, we need to work on some of these guys. But, so you don't have all that much stuff out there. But like I said, we dug 15 pits. Most of them were four feet or deeper. We found roots to three foot deep. Now, look at this. Cereal run. Doesn't look like much. There is three foot of roots underneath this in the soil. Again, it's not so much about what's on top, it's what's happening underneath. Three feet of soil. This picture is kind of cool. You can see an old corn root growing down here, and the cover crop next to that, that yellow ruler, and the cover crop is growing down that same channel. This is a no-till field, long-term no-till field. This was a very dense soil. When I poked in it with my knife, I thought, man, this is kind of hard. The roots obviously think differently. The corn roots are going down every year, straight down into that soil. They like that dense soil to grow into. You cover crops do too. A couple of remarks and then we're done. Radishes. One thing about radishes, the bigger the radish, the bigger the stink. As they rot in the late winter, they have a bit of an odor to them. A lot of odor, and we've actually had volunteer fire departments being called in for gas leaks. <laughs> Turned out to be radish fields. They're very interesting. This is actually on Jamie's farm. Uh, in the spring, they look like an empty sock hanging in the ground. Like one of those little lanterns, you use a Coleman lantern where you go camping and you have to burn them off before you can use those. That's exactly what they look like. They're kind of brittle, although you can pick them up. Tons and tons and tons of earthworms. They love those radishes. In the fall, when we were digging these pits last week, a lot of earthworms around the radishes. They love those things. In the spring, enormous amount of radishes. That's, I think, one of the reasons that we don't have big holes in the ground when we plant corn, when the radishes are all rotten and done, because the earthworms have tilled all that stuff up for us. Fort, Warren, Fort Wayne Farm Show, last January. There's a seed company there was bragging about how big a radishes their seed makes. So last year they went into the field just before the farm show, dug up a radish and proudly brought it into their booth and within two hours the whole exhibit hall was complaining about the stench that that radish was doing. So this year they got smart and they vacuum wrapped it so they can still show off the rabbits, but it doesn't think so bad. So, cover crops and soil health. The increased rooting depth for corn and soybeans. Those cover crops will dilly, drill into the ground, make room for corn and soybean roots. They break up compaction. They break through very hard layers in the soil. In Illinois, they have fragile pans in their soil. They only can form the top 18 inches. Underneath is just a rock layer of clay. The yields are very low in that county. Five years of annual ryegrass. The corn roots are going through those compacted layers. They're getting yields they had never dreamed of. Yields are much, much higher. So the decaying roots add organic matter because we need to add organic matter to all our soils because we're low in organic matter after that many years of tilling and we extend that growing season like we talked about. There's a couple good uh, cover crop sources. The left one is managing cover crops profitably, $19. You can read the whole thing for free online. Just Google that word and it sends you to a website where the whole book is there. A lot of districts have them. That book is a couple hundred pages. It talks about cover crops across the entire United States. Uh, the guys from uh, the land grant universities basically make the cliff notes out of that book, and they came up with the Midwest Cover Crop Field Guide. It has the cover crops that really work well for us in uh, the Midwest, and it, it shows you what the benefits of those are. We have a website. It's called ccsin.org, Conservation Cropping Systems Indiana.org. There's a lot of information on cover crops. It has that, that little selector tool, that, that model that shows you what cover crops you can get in. It has video clips on how to set up your planter once you go to no-till or you start messing with cover crops. It also has some videos about these soil health demonstrations we just did for you. And uh, the Midwest Cover Crop Council is actually hosted here at Michigan State University. It has a cool website. Then there's this plantcovercrops.com. And all these websites are linked to our website, by the way, if you can get this all down. And then, one thing, you, on YouTube, Google the word Cover Crop Guy. One of our Sonoma Water Conservation District guys like what this uh, Plant Cover Crops guy is doing, and he's doing that too. Little videos where he talks about his soil pits. So last week, when we did all the soil pits, 
when the farmers were gone, he'd dive in a hole and do a quick video of those cool roots growing out there. Very cool stuff. So with that, here's my contact information. No, I don't have it here. Okay. I'll have to, my email is uh, my name, Hans Koch, LLC at gmail.com and yes, I take out of state questions and answers. And my phone number and everything is on the website, ccsin.org. I have gone way over. Do we have time for questions or do we do that this afternoon during the yeah, discussion period? Questions. Is there a scrumptious lunch waiting for us? Uh, no, we're going to do one session first. Oh, okay. So, okay. All right. <coughs> Any questions? I'll be here the rest of the day. Uh, through the afternoon, we're doing another session with farmers here, and then a, a session is afternoon about some of the profitability. And Jamie, are you staying for the meeting? Jamie's actually done a bunch of calculating on his own farm about profitability out there, so I hope we can Shanghai him in the meeting and told him about that. But can you do that? Okay, great. Any questions about the soil health thing? Yes, sir. You know the robot in the room? Well, the robot run 24-7. If they get a docking station where it charges, does it get seed and all that stuff? Maybe it does. But actually, I don't even know whether that thing was gas. I think it's gas driven, so you'd have to somehow or another get it fired up. But you could make that electric, I imagine. If you can drive a Tesla for 200 and some miles, maybe you can have a robot go through the field for 200 acres or so if you hook it up. Sir? Yeah. Um, I'm a no-till uh, farmer. I read where uh, uh, the earthworms uh, at this advantage where they go up and take the weed seeds and bring them down to the ground. Well, weed seeds, so the question was that earthworms could potentially bring weed seeds in the ground and uh, plant next to the weed crop for you. I'll show you the opposite story. We've had some failures in cover crops. And all the cover crops came up in little plucks because the earthworms had exactly that. They had taken, the, earth, they had taken the, the cover crop seeds and put them in the soil. Weed seeds are pretty specific about how deep they need to be. If an earthworm takes them past an inch, a lot of those weed seeds won't come up anymore because they're too deep in the ground. Most of them are very shallow because they're not, usually not uh, counting on, uh, on uh, tillage to be planted that deep. So yeah, earthworms can mess up seeding sometimes with, with moving stuff around. Is it a factor? I hear very few complaints about it. Other questions? One last little demo for you here. Here's the dreaded radish. This is more what you can expect to get for a growth around here, if you get that tall. The roots are to the bottom of this tube. And I planted those uh, when it was South Bend. I planted them two weeks before South Bend. When October did we October 4th. So What's that? October 4th. October 4th. So I planted those just before October. Uh, annual ryegrass, same day planted. The whole tube is full of roots. Why is that important? This is last year's annual ryegrass, and it has a lot of pulling power on all the soil with all the roots in there because it has this huge amount of roots in it. This is the one from last year I took out. and uh, Now we found fields where you get annual ryegrass to go five feet or six feet deep with its roots. So it's very powerful in breaking up soils and doing all this stuff for us. Okay. Colleen is here with the hoop. Take me on the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, annual ryegrass in the springtime, what do you recommend for the burn down? Annual ryegrass in springtime. I didn't get to that because I only was given an hour and it took an hour and a half already. But you got to be careful. you got to be on your game with that one. If you have five feet of roots hanging on a little four or five inch plant, you need to have, by the way, what do you call it here? Pesticide applicator or something? I'm not licensed. I cannot make herbicide recommendations. So what I hear other farmers are doing is they use the full rate of atrazine or the full rate of glyphosate. Don't mix it with stuff like atrazine because that mess messes up different modes of action, stop the glyphosate from working. A lot of farmers, keep in mind, we usually use well water for that. Well water is very hard and it's usually at a very high pH. So there's a couple things you need to do about it. The label tells you that you can put AMS, or ammonium sulfate, in there, 70 pounds per 100 gallons, and that takes care of the hardness. Does it? Has have anybody ever measured that? In a lot of our wells, it doesn't. So you need to buy some of those little strips where you can actually measure your hardness in the water, make sure you actually have taken care of the hardness if you haven't done more AMS in there. Some farmers use acids, like citric acid they put in the tank to bring that pH down, because our well water is a pH of eight, 
Um, the uh, glyphosate works best at pH of four or five. So they, they bring the pH way down in their spray water and they just fry it in annual ryegrass. But a couple other things. Glyphosate works really well when it's warm because the plants need to be actively grown. When your ryegrass is not actively grown, glyphosate is not going to do much. So the, the time of day that you're spraying, you have to have nights that stay well into the 40s. You need to have daytime temperatures that are in the 50s or 60s. You cannot spray before the dew is off in the morning and by 2 or 3 in the afternoon you really ought to quit because otherwise the stuff doesn't get in the plant anymore. And uh, so basically you wait for the windiest part of the day. You need to go spray around it, right? <laughs> so, yeah. It is tough, but it can be done, but you need all those little details to take care of. One more? Uh, the time is going to be here all day. Yeah, I'll be here all day. So, so. make sure you grab him. Um, we wanted to thank you. We wanted to add to your wine. Oh, course. there we go. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate that. Rock these shirts out because I know. All right. Don't farm naked. Thanks very much.